This session will begin with thermal protection. Okay. This can be asked as your five marker and uh, very regular question and important question for your Viva voice. Fine. Um, coming to the definitions. So basic definitions. Let's see. What is normal axillary temperature? What is the normal temperature range in the newborn? That is between 36.5 to 37.5 degree Celsius. Fine. Then how do we define hypothermia? That is important. No. So anything less than 36.5 degrees Celsius is hypothermia. <coughs> in hypothermia, then we can divide it into three parts. As we all know, it one is cold stress, moderate hypothermia, and severe hypothermia. Cold stress is between 36 to 36.4 degrees Celsius. Moderate is between 32 to 35.9 degrees Celsius. And severe is less than 32 degree Celsius. And what is hyperthermia? Hyperthermia is above 37.5 degree Celsius. And few other definitions. What is thermoneutral environment? Thermoneutral environment is the narrow range of environmental temperature, environmental temperature at which the baby can maintain it. That the normal body temperature is maintained. Fine. So it is the environmental temperature at which the baby can maintain its minimal BMR for it to maintain a normal body temperature. Next is what is thermoregulatory environment? What is the difference between thermoneutral environment and thermoregulatory environment? Thermoregulatory environment is the environmental temperature <coughs> beyond the thermoneutral environment range at which the baby increases its BMR, okay, increases his or her BMR. To maintain the normal body temperature that is thermoregulatory environment. So that is the difference between thermoneutral and thermoregulatory environment. Fine. <coughs> Next is why do we give so much importance to hypothermia? Why do we give so much importance to temperature control? Is because these newborns are very susceptible to hypothermia, correct? And why are they susceptible? One is because of large surface area. Two, because they have limited heat generating mechanisms as such, like how in adolescents or younger children, how it is developed, that doesn't happen so in newborns, correct? And especially in low birth weight babies, babies weighing less than 2.5 kgs, they're even more prone to hypothermia. And why is that? That is because of poor insulination due to the lower subcutaneous fat that is present in these newborns and decreased brown fat that is present in these low birth weight babies. And they're more permeable skin, so they are more prone for dehydration, again, hypothermia, they have a larger surface area and they have poor physiological response to hypothermia and early exhaustion of the metabolic stores like glucose. So they have poor physiological response to hypothermia and even if they respond, the stores of glucose that is there is very less for the BMR to increase and BMR to increase and increase the body temperature of the baby as such. So. <laughs> These are the reasons why newborns are very susceptible to hypothermia. Fine. Okay. Next. Next is how do we measure? Fine. So it can be either measured by digital thermometer or by human touch. Okay. How do we measure it by human touch? As we all know, abdominal temperature is the one that gives us the core temperature. Correct. So what do we do is with the back side of our palm, with the back side of our palm, we touch both the feet as well as the abdomen. We touch the abdomen and the feet, fine? Abdomen and the feet, we touch. If both are warm to touch, if both the feet as well as abdomen are warm to touch, then the temperature is between 36 to 37.5 degrees Celsius, so thermal comfort is maintained. But if feet or palms are cold and abdomen is warm to touch, then we tell that the baby is in cold stress, okay? So it is between 36 to 36.5 degree Celsius. But if both the feet as well as abdomen is cold to touch, <coughs> then the baby is in hypothermia. That is less than 30, 36 degree Celsius. Okay. And next is with the axillary temperature with digital thermometer. And that is the one that is recommended. And as it is shown in this picture on the right side, how do we measure? We measure it by keeping it parallel to the axilla. Okay. We measure it by keeping it parallel to the axilla, not perpendicular, but we keep it parallel to the axilla and we measure, okay? So how do we measure? Clean the thermometer because asepsis has to be maintained, okay? Place the bulb against the roof of the axilla that is not perpendicular. Again, it is parallel to the axilla. 
Then you hold it firmly, hold the axilla firmly against the chest wall. Wait for three minutes. <coughs> Read the time temperature and find in there. Clean the thermometer again and keep it back. Okay, this is how we measure. And next is when do we measure? Correct. When do we measure? One is immediately after completing the initial care of newborn to see whether the baby is in thermal comfort or not, and then. We will have to do it in the postnatal ward. In the postnatal ward, fine. So, routine measurements for healthy baby usually it is not required. Usually it is not required because healthy baby they will be in the mother side. Skin to skin contact will be maintained, and once that is maintained, or regular clothing will be put to the child. And so we assume that the baby is in thermal comfort. If the baby is sick, then every two hours we usually monitor. And if they are low birth weight babies, especially we will have to monitor even if they are. In the mother side, we'll have to monitor at least twice daily. And if it is less than 1500 grams, at least four times daily, it has to be monitored. These two, even if they're on the mother side, healthy baby, we will have to monitor twice daily and four times daily. Okay. Next is what is warm chain? What is warm chain? These are the steps that is taken to prevent hypothermia. These are the steps that is taken to prevent hypothermia. And this can come as your viva voice or as your five marker. What are the 10 steps of warm chain. What are the 10 steps of warm chain? One is first step is the delivery room. The delivery room or the OT as such has to be warm. For that, uh, temperature of around 26 to 20, 24 to 26 degrees Celsius has to be maintained, either, whether it is the OT or the delivery room. Next is the resuscitation corner. So the resuscitation corner has to be maintained warm. For this, what do we do? Before 20 minutes itself, we go to the uh, the neonatal uh, resuscitation corner. <coughs> we see that before 20 minutes, it is warm. The temperature creep that is there, we'll have to keep it, switch it on, put it to the maximum heater output, and we'll have to keep it on 20 minutes before hand itself. Okay. Next is immediate drain. As soon as we receive the baby, we'll have to take a warm, pre-warm line and cloth and dry the baby immediately. Once, if it is a healthy term newborn, we, as we have already seen, we'll have to immediately put it back on the mother's abdomen so that we maintain skin-to-skin -skin contact. As, as soon as we put it on mother's abdomen, as mother's abdomen, as the mother's body temperature will be between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius, baby also will automatically maintain the same warmth, correct? So immediately after the baby is born, we'll have to put it on skin-to-skin -skin contact. Then we'll have to mention, measure, make sure that early breastfeeding is done, okay? And then bathing is postponed initially for seven days, meaning the deep bath should be postponed and appropriate clothing, like as we see in this figure, the head and the <coughs> arms and swords should be covered with socks with a good sweater over the body, okay? So everything should be covered, fine? as we see in this image, fine. Then rooming in mother and the baby should not be separated 24 hours per day. And we will have to train the mother as well as the attenders and we will have to raise awareness regarding hypothermia, what are the consequences, okay? And how do we maintain the temperature? And in case if transport is needed for the newborn, we will have to transport it using the transport incubator, okay? This is the transport incubator. Next is hypothermia. If you are asked the question about hypothermia, initially, as we have already done in the initial part, first part is the definition of hypothermia, okay? This we have already covered. Definition of hypothermia is already done. Fine. Next is, <coughs> what are the signs of hypothermia? One is early signs. Next is the late signs. Early signs, the body is trying to cope up. Fine. So, that results from peripheral vasoconstriction, fine. So there'll be peripheral vasoconstriction that results in hypothermia. This will have parallel, if there can be acrocyanosis, that is the peripheries will become cyanosed, cool extremities will be there, that is the palms and soles will be cool, but the abdomen still will be warm. The baby is in cold stress or decreased peripheral pulsation can be felt and the baby will be irritable. Now, what are the late signs? If we do not take appropriate measures, over here, then the, then the baby will manifest with late signs because baby will undergo CNS depression. So there can be lethargy, there can be bradycardia, baby might go into apnea, baby will have poor feeding, baby will have hypotonia, or they'll have weak suck and cry. 
fine. Or they can have certain abdominal signs like increased gastric residual, abdominal distension, and frequent episodes of vomiting. Fine. So these are the signs of early and late signs of hypothermia. Now, what if there is prolonged hypothermia? Prolonged hypothermia can lead to grave consequences like hypoglycemia, hypoxia, metabolic acidosis. The child can have coagulation abnormality, persistent pulmonary hypertension, and all these things can lead to death and mortality. Fine. <coughs> so it is very important to identify with this as it is important to prevent the baby going into hypothermia. Even if the baby goes into hypothermia, we'll have to identify it and treat the child. Correct. And chronic cold stress can lead to poor weight gain. So how do we manage? If the baby is in cold stress or moderate hypothermia, then we'll have to remove the baby from the source that is causing hypothermia. Okay. Then we'll have to start skin to skin contact. And <coughs> if skin to skin contact is not possible, then as we already saw the clothing, we'll have to cover the head. We'll have to cover the palms and soles and we'll have to make the baby wear good clothing with sweater, okay? And we'll have to monitor the temperature frequently. If the baby is having severe hypothermia, then we'll have to shift the child to the ICU. We'll have to remove the baby again from the source. We'll have to place the child in incubator or the radiant former, fine. We'll have to do rapid rewarming till the baby reaches 34 degrees Celsius. From then onwards, slow rewarming until the baby maintains normal temperature. We can start the baby on IV fluids. We'll have to monitor blood glucose levels and oxygen can be provided if needed. Okay. So that was to do with the hypothermia. This is the radiant format where we we'll have to ship the child. Fine. So <coughs> that was to do with hypothermia. Next topic we'll be covering is Kangaroo mother care, okay? KMC, nothing but kangaroo mother care. Now this is this can again come as your 10 marker or five marker, uh, very important question as such. So what is the basic definition, definition of KMC? KMC or kangaroo mother care, this is nothing but care of preterm or low birth weight infants by placing them in skin to skin contact with the mother or any other caregiver. Again, this is also basically to prevent hypothermia as well as the growth of the child. Fine. So care of freedom in the low birth weight infants. Now, this is the personality who first suggested Kangara Mother Care, Dr. Edgar. Now, what are the four components of the kangaroo mother care? One is kangaroo position, which we will see. Next is kangaroo nutrition, that is breastfeeding of the child on kangaroo mother care. Next is when do we discharge the baby? And then how do we follow up the same child, same baby? Okay, so these are the four components. Kangaroo position, kangaroo nutrition, kangaroo discharge, and kangaroo follow-up. Fine. Next is what are the benefits? What are the benefits for the baby? If we are, if they, if we put the baby on kangaroo mother care, so basic physiological benefits is one is obvious that is on putting skin to skin contact there will be reduction in hypothermia. That is what we read till now. Next is <coughs> the vitals and the sleep pattern gets stabilized. Okay, and what are the clinical benefits? One is increased exclusive breastfeeding rates because once we put the child onto the mother's chest, automatically the mother's breastfeeding mothers milk as well will get stimulated and the baby as well will breastfeed, correct? So increased breastfeeding rates, increased milk production in the mother, decreased risk of mortality because the child baby might ask if we have kept a low birth weight baby or preterm baby, that baby outside, that baby might go into apnea, can have death, correct? Or instead we place the baby with on skin to skin contact, the mother's breathing efforts itself will prevent apnea because the mother's chest will be rising that will stimulate the baby which will stimulate it to breathe correct so there is decreased risk of mortality there is decreased length of hospital stay because there can be good weight gain correct that good weight gain if there is satisfactory and good weight gain then the length of hospital stay will in turn end up decreasing correct decreased risk of nosocomial infection or sepsis and there is increased rate of weight gain, length gain, as well as head circumference gain. So there are numerous benefits by giving KMC. 
correct next what is the criteria for eligibility so any stable low birth weight baby so any baby less than 2.5 kg which is stable can be put to mother's chest for kangaroo mother care and sick babies once they are hemodynamically stable we will have to immediately start kmc correct <coughs> so if the baby is less than 1.2 kg it may take days to weeks because the baby who are less born so preterm will need nicu stay correct so once they are hemodynamically stable even inside inside nicu we can call the mother and start giving kmc if the child is between 1.2 to 1.8 kg it may take initial one few days to weeks because they might as well be inside nicu and now they'll have they can have problem of their own once they are treated and hemodynamically stable we can start kmc and if they are more than 1.8 kg most of the times they'll be mother side itself so we'll have to increase the mother and counsel regarding starting KMC immediately after the birth. So any of the mother or if mother is sick, any of father or any of the relatives who are willing to give, who, is, who are in good health condition and who are maintaining good hygiene can give KMC. It is just not restricted to mother herself. Fine. Okay. So how do we initiate KMC? First part is the counseling the mother or the relatives as to how to give KMC. Fine. Then mother will have to, as we see in this picture, as we see in this picture, mother should wear, mother or the relative whoever is giving should wear loose clothing so that the baby can fit into the chest. Correct. We'll have to prevent hypothermia as well simultaneously. So mother should wear a loose clothing. We we'll can put the mother so that we can put the baby through that mother's clothing. And then again, we'll have to give good cap and stocks to wear for the palms and soul so that hypothermia is prevented fine and mother's clothing should be there and we'll have for the support of the baby we'll have to wrap the baby with the towel as well correct so and then baby's clothing as i've already explained cap and palms and soles socks to prevent hypothermia next is Kangaroo positioning. What is Kangaroo positioning? How do we position the baby? Now, as we can see in this image, first is position of the head. Position of the head. So, how is the position of the head? Head should be slightly turned and chin should touch the mother's chest. Okay. <coughs> and it should be slightly extended so that one, there is eye to eye contact between the mother and the baby. Two, it also prevents obstruction so that that obstruction itself will not cause apnea, correct? So head should be slightly extended, chin should be turned and touching the chest, okay? Next, the hands should be flexed, hands should be flexed. Baby's abdomen should be touching the mother's chest and abdomen so that with each breathe of the mother, baby as well gets stimulated and baby as well can breathe and the... Hip and knee should be flexed. Hip and knees should be flexed. Okay. So this is the kangaroo positioning. Fine. Good. Next is we'll have to monitor the child frequently because they are all be low birth weight babies. So we will have to invariably monitor the babies frequently along with temperature and vitals. Fine. And since they are low birth weight babies, they will be preterm. If they're less than 34 weeks, they'll not be able to breastfeed. So we'll have to teach the mother regarding part of feeds, fine, and privacy should be maintained. And then next question will be, how long to do, give this KMC, correct? What is the duration? As long as possible, if possible, even 24 hours a day, the mother has to give KMC to the baby. So however longer we provide, more is the benefit both to the baby as well as the mother, correct? So that is what is written. <coughs> Initially, we start gradually. And duration of skin to skin contact should be increased maximum up to 24 hours a day. So throughout the day. So we'll have to minimum sessions of more than one hour should be given because less than one hour might not provide any of the physiological or clinical benefits to the baby. And if mother wants to sleep, mother can sleep by giving KMC as well, but she'll have to be in semi reclined position up to 30 degrees semi reclined position. Okay, fine. Next is when do we stop KMC? As the mother can continue to give as long as she is comfortable. Okay, so once baby reaches more than 2.5 kg or gestational age and gestational age of more than 37 weeks is achieved, we can stop KMC. 
So that was to do with the KMC. Any doubts until now? So we'll continue with the next topic that is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding. This is again very, very important topic as we all know. So let's start with preparing the mother for breastfeeding. So when do we start preparing the mother for breastfeeding? We'll have to prepare, start preparing the mother and counsel the mother antenatally itself, not after the birth of the child, correct? So antenatally itself, we'll have to start counseling the mother <coughs> regarding the importance and how to breastfeed the child. And in the third trimester, at least once breast and nipples should be examined so that if the mother has flat nipple or inverted nipple, we can teach the mother before and, and we can anticipate the problems, correct? So breast and nipples should be examined once at least in the third trimester. And antenatally, we'll have to counsel the mother that she has to take minimum 300 kilocalories and 15 grams of protein extra and why the lactating mother should take around 500 kilocalories and 25 grams of protein extra it's fine next is initiation of breastfeeding when do we initiate breastfeeding so the best answer possible is as early as possible as early as possible maximum within 15 minutes within th sorry, 30 minutes in normal vegetarian delivery and by one hour of cesarean section, breastfeeding should be started. And initial two to four days, most of the times, mothers and their relatives come telling that baby is not fair. The mother is not secreting enough milk. Can we give something else? The answer is absolutely no. Because the initial two to three days, mother will secrete to the maximum around 10 to 15 ml of milk, correct? And that is not even seen to us. Fine. It's only after the baby suckles onto the breast, those droplets are available. So we'll have to counsel the <coughs> parents and the attenders regarding that. And the initial two to four days, what we get is called as colostrum. What is it? It is called as colostrum. And what is the importance of this? It is rich in proteins and immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin A, secretory IgA especially. And it is rich in vitamin A, D, E, and K. And it contains more of sodium, protein, and immunoglobulin but less of fat and lactose as compared to the breast milk that is that will start start getting produced after three to four days. Okay. Next is what is the duration that the baby should be breastfed each time? So the minimum duration is twenty minutes. Each breastfeeding, each breastfeeding session should be for a minimum duration of twenty minutes. Okay. And why is it so? Because the initial part of the milk that we get is something called as fore milk. And the later part of the milk that is what we get is called as the hind milk. Okay, the property of fore milk is different from the property of hind milk. And for proper nutrition to be received to the newborn baby, it, it needs both the fore milk as well as the hind milk. This requires proper emptying of the mother's breast in that particular breast in that full session. So that is why the duration of minimum 20 minutes. So four milk is the initial part of the milk. It has more of the water content. So as the baby is very much eager to feed, it will satisfy the thirst of the baby, the initial part of the milk, okay? And it is rich in protein, sugar, vitamins, and minerals. And what is the property of hind milk? Hind milk is the later part of the milk. It is much thicker as compared to the four milk. So that will satisfy the hunger of the baby. That will satisfy the hunger of the baby. And that is rich in fats. So that is the difference between four milk and high milk. And the importance of feeding the baby for a minimum of 20 minutes for each session. And what is the, next comes the technique of breastfeeding. Next comes the technique of breastfeeding. <coughs> now this involves positioning of the child as well as the attachment, positioning of the child as well as the attachment. So how do we position? How do we position is the back of the mother, back of the mother, as we see in this image, should be well rested. Back of the mother should be well rested. Okay. And the mother should, if we should make sure that the mother should not 
lean on to the baby. Mother should not lean on to the baby. Fine. So back of the mother should be well rested to a pillow. Okay. And the whole body is supported. So as we see over here, whole body of the baby is supported with mother's hand. Correct. Whole body of the baby is supported. So the if this is the baby, the buttocks should be supported and head should be supported near the elbow. Correct. Head should be supported over here with the elbow and the buttocks should be supported with the palm. Correct. And we'll have to hold on to the baby so that the whole body is supported and it is in one line. So head and body should be in one line. As we have seen, head and body should be in one line. As we see in this image as well. Okay. And the body should be turned towards the mother so that the baby's abdomen will touch mother's abdomen and chin is turned towards the mother's breast. So body should be turned towards the mother. Okay. And nose is at the level of the nipple. So nose is at the level of the nipple. So this image explains it all. And there can be various positions as well. Now what we have ex explained is the cradle position and there are whether other positions positions like cross cradle or the football hold or the sideline and laid back positions so we don't need to go into the details of that so basic is the cradle position and that is what we have learned now next is <coughs> after we have positioned the baby after we have positioned the baby well how does the baby attach or suck on to the mother's breast even that as well is important so that the baby sucks effectively and enough milk from the mother's breast goes into the baby's mouth. Fine. So that is what is explained over here along with this image. The mouth is wide open. Mouth is the four important points are mouth is wide open. Lips are everted. Lips are everted. Okay. Chin is touching the breast. Chin is touching the breast. And most of the nipple and areola are inside the mother's mouth. Just not the nipple, even the areola should be inside the mouth of the baby. See over here, it has covered the nipple as well as the areola, correct? So most of the nipple as well as the areola should be inside the baby's mouth. That is what, that is when we call it as good attachment. So we'll have to know four points for positioning of the baby and four points for the attachment of the baby. So that was to do with the technique of breastfeeding. Next is what are the reflexes that are present in the mother and what are the reflexes that are present in the baby that helps in breastfeeding of the child, correct? So in mother, as you all know, there are two reflexes. One is the prolactin reflex that helps to secrete more milk by the alveolar epithelial cells. Next is the oxytocin reflex that helps to eject the milk from the mother's breast onto the baby. <coughs> now, what is prolactin reflex? It is also called milk secretion reflex because it helps in the secreting mother's milk. Usually it is produced in the night mother. So that is the importance of breastfeeding even in the night. Every two hourly baby mother has to breastfeed the child. Okay. So as soon as the baby suckles, as soon as the baby suckles, more and more prolactin gets secreted in the blood from the pituitary. Okay. So baby sucking onto the mother's breast is the reflex. Okay. That helps in secreting more and more prolactin hormone from the pituitary and more so in the night, which is the important of night feeding. And that prolactin in the blood reaches the alveolar epithelial cells through the blood and helps in increasing the secretion of milk. Next is oxytocin reflex. Next is oxytocin reflex or it is also called as milk ejection reflex because it helps to eject the milk or the letdown reflex. So what are the stimulus for increase in oxytocin? One is baby sucking onto the mother's blood, mother's breast. Next is mother thinks of the baby lovingly or any sound or stimulus of the baby, okay, will increase the confidence of the mother and that will in turn enhance oxytocin secretion from the posterior pituitary. But whereas right opposite of that, any worry, stress, pain or anxiety decreases oxytocin secretion. So these are the two reflexes from the mother's side. And what are the reflexes in from the baby that helps in successful breastfeeding? That is one is the rooting reflex. What is rooting reflex? As soon as we touch the side of the baby's nipple, sorry, baby's lips, 
baby turns towards the mother's breast and nipple so once mother's nipple stimulates the baby onto the side of the lip the baby turns towards the mother's breast so that it can suck onto it next is the sucking and swallowing reflex which will get coordinated by 34 weeks period of gestation <coughs> next question will be how often to breastfeed the baby correct this is the these are the common questions that we encounter so the ideal schedule is exclusive breastfeeding on demand whenever baby demands whenever baby ask for milk the mother will understand certain cues that are present in the baby as it is hungry and mother should go on to feed the child okay and on an average eight times per day or 15 to and eight times per day and 15 to 20 minutes each session now we have fed the baby okay fine but how do we understand whether what we have the uh, breast milk that is given to the baby is sufficient or not okay this is by seeing the one is urine output fine if the baby is passing six to eight times per in per day six to eight times urine output per day then that means to say that there is adequate sufficient breastfeed being given to the child next is once the baby breastfeeds, it sleeps adequately. Around one to two hours, it sleeps well. Okay. Then there is regular weight gain, adequate weight gain. Okay. <coughs> and next is it passes one to six liquid stools per day. So these are the pointers towards the points that baby is being breastfed adequately and sufficiently. Next. What are certain contraindications? Contraindications are again absolute and relative. Absolute con contraindication is congenital lactose intolerance, congenital lactose intolerance and galactosemia. And certain medications like anti malignancy drugs and chemotherapeutic drugs and psychotropic drugs, these are certain contraindications, absolute contraindications. And relative contraindications are certain things like maternal HIV, but in our country, we even if the mother is Having HIV, we start the baby on nevirapine prophylaxis and we encourage the mother to give exclusive breastfeeding. And maternal TB, if she is not treated, then initial two weeks, the mother should receive TB treatment for the treatment for TB and then she can start breastfeeding the baby. And if there is any active varicella or herpes simplex infection, we'll have to treat and then start breastfeeding. <coughs> so, next is what are the advantages of breastfeeding? This is again one of the important questions that is asked. Okay. New one is whatever breastfeed that is given in the initial six months that breastfeeding, the breast milk is enough to take care of all the nutritional requirements of the child. Correct. So it has nutritional superiority. Next is carbohydrates that is present has a very high lactose concentration around six to seven grams per deciliter that is needed for the baby to digest. <coughs> and the galactase, galactase enzyme that is present in the breast milk is necessary for the formation of galactocerebrocytes. And this in turn is required for good CNS maturity. Next is protein content. It has a low protein content as compared to cow's milk and that is required. This low protein content is required for the baby's kidney to function adequately. Okay, So it is around 0.9 to 1.1 grams per deciliter and next is the way is to casein ratio is 80 is to 20 and this is needed for easy easy digestibility of the breast milk okay and this whey protein contains lactalbumin and lactoglobulin both of which are necessary for again cns development this lactalbumin is rich in tryptophan and this tryptophan is precursor for serotonin. And as we all know, serotonin is the neurotransmitter that is needed. Correct. So next is amino acids like taurine and cysteine that is present in the breast milk is important for neurotransmission and neuromodulation as well. So it can act as neurotransmitters needed for the production of neurotransmitters and it helps in neuromodulation as well. Next, coming to the, we have finished carbohydrates, we have finished proteins. Next is the fat content in the breast milk. And this fat content is rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids. And this PUFA is required for myelination. Okay. And the next one is it is rich in omega 2 and omega 6 fatty acids. And this in turn is needed for prostaglandin and cholesterol secretion. Okay. Next is vitamins and minerals. So we have done with major protein, major 
nutritional requirement now coming to the minor that is vitamins and minerals okay vitamins and mineral content in breastfeed is enough to nourish the child for the initial 6 months of life and the calcium is to phosphorus ratio is more than 2 okay that again in turn helps in good calcium absorption fine and lactose lactase that is present in the breast milk also pro promotes calcium and magnesium absorption next coming to the water and electrolytes 88% of the breast milk contains water okay and there is low solute load as well low solute load and low protein content which is optimum for the immature kidney of the baby immature kidney of the newborn baby next is microbiological it contains certain molecules that can prevent it from getting infection one is the breast milk as it is is very sterile so it there is very less chance of contamination as compared to cow's milk and most of the times what the parents do is they end up feeding it with the uh, 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 nipple they end up feeding with bottle so this bottle feeding will lead to again contamination of the nipple which is present in the bottle and that in turn can cause infection in the baby so as compared to that this is sterile. Next is it contains lactoferrin and this lactoferrin is bacteriostatic and it inhibits E. coli growth. Next, it contains bile salt stimulated lipases. Bile salt stimulated lipases which kills amoeba and giardia. Next, it also contains PABA which is a protection against malaria and it contains bifidus factor and acidic pH and these two molecules will lead to increased colonization by Lactobacillus bifidus, okay. Lactobacillus bifidus, which is in turn a good bacteria and that is needed for good digestion, correct? Okay. And what are the immunological superiority that breastfeeding has? It is non allergic, it is non allergic, and it supplies passive immunity. It supplies passive immunity that is again enough for the initial six months of baby's life. So it transfers macrophages, lysozymes, and complements. It gives transfer secretory IgA and all these things fine so it is immunologically superior and there is lower risk of allergy ear infection or any orthodontic problems as compared to babies who are not breastfed and in the future as well there is lower risk of developing any diabetes heart disease or <coughs> malignancies such as lymphoma and there is better mother to baby bonding and higher iq and various benefits not only to the baby but to the mother as well because that it results in uterine involution there is reduced chances of postpartum hemorrhage there is lactational amenorrhea so it leads to physiological contraception and there is decreased risk of car carcinoma breast as well as ovary so in short babies who are breast are 14 times less likely to die from diarrhea. They are four times less likely to die from any pneumonia or any other respiratory infections. And they are 2.5 times less likely to die from any other infection. So this is the advantage and importance of breastfeeding. Next, coming to storage, in the under room temperature, breastfeeding can be stored between 6 to 8 hours. If refrigerated, they can be stored for 24 hours. And if frozen, in milk bank, it can be stored up to three months. <laughs> the next question that you can be asked in your Viva or in your theory for five marks is difference between human milk and cow's milk. Now, as we all already read, there is low protein content in human milk as compared to cow's milk. So it is 1.1 gram and cow's milk is three grams. And the protein content in cow's milk is biochemically different. So it is less digestible as compared to the breast milk. Next is waste to casein ratio. If there was a mistake here, sorry, this forty is to twenty. Forty is to twenty. Um, this forty is to sixty. In human milk, <laughs> it casein is to be very very forty is to and the casein is the casein that is present in the breast milk beat casein, and this beta casein is not other.
sorry i just got disconnected Then coming to the lactase content, it is seven grams in human milk <coughs> as compared to four point five grams in cow's milk. Fat content in human milk is three point eight grams in cow's milk. It is for three point seven grams. Essential fatty acids is thirteen percent in human milk as compared to two percent in cow's milk. Calcium is to phosphorus ratio, which enhances calcium absorption, is more than two in human's milk as compared to cow's milk, which is less than two. Solute load is low, so that helps in the digestion. That helps in excreting in case of immature kidneys. Okay, and the vitamins that is lacking in human milk is vitamin D and vitamin K. Vitamin D and vitamin K. Okay, and it has good mineral contents that is needed for the initial six months of life. And the total kilocalories is sixty-seven kilocalories for both human as well as breast milk. Okay. Fine. Next, uh, next coming the uh, next topic which we'll deal with in breastfeeding is the common problems that we encounter while breastfeeding. What are the common problems that we encounter? One is this we routinely see it in the postnatal one that is either the flat nipple or the inverted nipple. Flat nipple or inverted nipple. Now, how do we test whether it is flat or inverted nipple? In case there is a short and protracted nipple. We initially try to protract it. Okay, we initially try to pull it. Once it is, once we pull the nipple, if it gets protracted, then we don't call it as flat or inverted nipple. If we are unable to protract it, then we term it as flat or inverted nipple. So in <coughs> in case there is flat or inverted nipple, then what do we do? How do we treat? So the initial. Fifteen days or so, we ask the mother to use the syringe. So we take a ten cc syringe. Okay, we take a ten cc syringe. We cut it. We cut it. Then we remove the cap and insert it in the opposite direction. Okay, and then we put on to the mother's breast. We put on to the mother's breast, and then we pull it. Then we pull it so that the nipple gets protracted. Or we can use Double syringe technique as well. So, using the syringe, we try to protract, and this is done before every session of breastfeeding for the initial ten to fifteen days, so that as soon as we as as and when we keep protracting the nipple in each of the sessions, it so happens that by ten to fine by the initial one to two weeks, the nipple remains protracted. Okay, so that is the idea behind it. Next problem we can encounter is breast engorgement. Breast Engorgement. So when does this happen? As milk, if the baby doesn't feed to the, if the baby is not made to feed properly on time, or if inadequate breastfeeding is given, what happens is the milk gets collected. Correct. The milk gets collected, and then what happens is it the amount that can be stored exceeds. Correct. The amount the breast can store, it takes the Milk that is secreted exceeds beyond that, so that leads to swollen, hard, warm, and painful breast, which is nothing but engorged breasts. So when all this happens, instead of breastfeeding the child, other feeds are given, or there is delayed initiation or early removal of the baby. If we do not continue for con continue for full twenty minutes, or there is bottle feeding, or any. Sort of restriction to breastfeeding it leads to breast engorgement, and in such cases, what do we do? In such cases, as it is a very painful condition, we can advise giving some tablet like PCT for the mother, and then we apply moist heat over the breast and 
gentle massage for around 3 to 5 minutes before each session of breast feeding and we try to express the excess breast muscle that is present okay so that the breast softens next is sore nipple or cracked nipple so when does this happen if the baby is not attached we initially saw the four steps of attachment correct and in that one of the step was mouth is lips are fully everted and it covers whole of the nipple as well as areola instead of doing this if baby just circles onto the nipple what happens is it results in sore or cracked nipple sore or cracked nipple and if this issue is not addressed over the cracked or sore nipple the bacteria goes into it and it that causes infection mastitis or abscess okay or oral thrush in the baby as well can lead to sore nipple or cracked nipple <coughs> treatment is nothing but we'll have to advise the mother regarding proper attachment okay we'll have to counsel and reposition the baby and we treat oral thrush if present in the baby and application of hind milk also act it acts as moisturizer because of increased fat content so we can apply that hind milk over the mother's nipple okay <coughs> if still babe mother is not able to breastfeed then we can ask her to express the milk until the nipple is healed until the sore nipple is healed okay next is blocked duct if baby doesn't suckle onto one of the part of the nipple it leads to blocked duct because that part of the nipple won't get drained next is mastitis or absence either if there is persistence of blocked duct or the sore nipple or cracked nipple is not healed in that case <coughs> infection can occur which leads to mastitis and delayed or incomplete treatment of this mastitis infection will further progress lead to accumulation of pus and cause breast abscess so these are certain routine problems that is encountered while breastfeeding so we have dealt with this topic i guess in detail okay so that was to do with the breastfeeding any doubts until now So the next topic will be care of low birth weight babies, care of low birth weight babies. This will be the last topic for the session. Okay. Now, basically, what is the definition of the low birth weight babies? Any baby weighing less than 2.5 kgs, correct? This we read in the first session itself, correct? And this low birth weight babies can either be preterm babies that are born less than gestational age, less than 37 weeks period of gestation, or they can be term babies, but they are IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction is present. Okay, so they can either be preterm birth babies or IUGR babies, and both of them can be included under low birth weight babies. So, first we'll deal with preterm babies. Preterm babies. So, preterm babies are nothing but neonates less than 36 weeks period of gestation, neonates born less than 36 weeks, 37 weeks period of gestation. And how do we classify them? We have already learned, read this. Extreme preterm is less than 28 weeks. Very preterm is between 28 to 32 weeks. Moderate is 32 to 34 weeks. And more than 34 weeks are called as late preterm. So this was the classification. Next is etiology. In most of the cases, we don't know the cause for as to why preterm babies occur. Okay. But it is most frequently seen in lower socioeconomic status certain races around the world, they are more prone for low, low birth weight babies. And in case of very early age or extremes of age, they are also more prone for low birth weight babies, low birth weight babies. And if the mother during her period of uh, carrying the baby, if there is long periods of standing or if she is under higher physical stress, then also it increases the chance and acute or chronic maternal illness that also influences multiple gestation births, okay, and prior poor birth outcome, all these things, all these factors increases the chances of low birth weight babies, but still proper cause is still not yet known, okay, and certain obstetric factors like uterine malformations, uterine trauma, placenta previa, premature rupture of membranes, chorioaminitis, etc., and certain fetal conditions like non-desharing NHT, IUGR, and severe hydrops these are certain conditions where there is 
preterm birth. Next is what are the problems encountered? Why are why are these preterm births? Why are they dealt with with certain amount of care? And why are they if they are less than twenty eight weeks or if they are less than thirty two weeks? Why do we ship them to NICU? What are the problems they face? Because they face certain problems, correct? So what are these problems associated with preterm birth? Okay, so this we'll see system wise because a term child is well developed. Preterm child is still not supposed to be born because they are still undergoing that period of development and they are born early. Correct. So what happens? Obviously, each and every system is still undergoing development. If that doesn't happen, each and every system will have certain problems faced because of the early birth of the child and not having achieved the optimum development. So coming to the respiratory system. what all can happen there can be perinatal depression which will not lead to the cns will not give enough drive for the respiratory system to breathe that will lead to apnea or the child can have respiratory distress because there can be rds will be there because there is no surfactant enough surfactant being produced apnea of prematurity can be there as already told or the child can go on to develop chronic lung disease or bronchopulmonary dysplasia what are the neurological problems that are encountered the baby might not cry at birth because again there is no stimulus so that will lead to perinatal depression these babies are prone to intraventricular hemorrhage they can go because the of the fragile capillaries it can lead to intraventricular hemorrhage and this intraventricular hemorrhage can progress to periventricular leukomalacia in cvs in cvs there can be patent ductus arteriosus or there can be hypovolemia or there can be as such the cardiac cannot contract properly and lead to cardiac dysfunction hematologically baby can have anemia or these children are more prone to neonatal jaundice as compared to term babies git they are more prone to necrotizing enterocolitis renal system they are more prone for fluid and electrolyte disturbances so they are more prone for dehydration they are more prone prone for hypernatremia all these problems can be encountered and as we already read the causes for temperature hypothermia we saw that low birth weight babies are more prone for hypothermia as compared to term babies and immunologically there is increased risk of infection because the immunological system as well is not developed so there is increased risk of neonatal sepsis and coming to ice there is retinopathy of prematurity again because of the vascularity is not well developed okay next coming to the long term problems what are the sequelae that we can expect in this low birth weight babies one is neurological disability can be there so that can lead to developmental delay and child can go on to have cerebral palsy the child can have other than the rather than the other than motor disability they can have effect on cognitive dysfunction as well and there can be sensory impairment as well like hearing loss visual impairment etc fine rop again can lead to vision loss okay chronic lung disease or bpd can occur these children will have poor growth and increased rate of childhood illness and admissions fine so these are the immediate problems as well as long term problems encountered in low birth weight babies so this was to low birth preterm babies more than low birth weight babies preterm babies fine so the initial part of low birth weight babies we read about preterm babies next let's go on to read, <coughs> read about iugr babies or small for gestational age babies so usually these two terms are used interchangeably sga babies and iugr usually they use interchangeably but there is a slight change in the definition there is a, if asked there is a slight change because the definition as such varies okay sga babies are the ones on plotting onto the fenton chart for that particular gestational age they fall less than 10th percentile so birth weight is less than 10th percentile for that gestational age on plotting to the fenton chart but what are iugr babies intra uterine growth restriction babies these are the ones ones in the abdomen mother's abdomen when they go for frequent scanning they check for growth velocity how the baby is growing correct so on checking that if there is diminished growth velocity in the fetus as documented by at least two intra uterine growth assessment then we call it to be iugr baby okay so the basic definition itself of sga and iugr babies is different fine but 
in general, we tend to use it interchangeably. Next, coming to the etiology, what are the causes for IUGR or SJ babies? So this we can be divided as maternal factors, placental factors, and fetal factors. What are the maternal factors? What can be certain demographic or race itself can be a cause? Maternal malnutrition, any uterine anomalies. Okay, so that if there is a uterine mass present, that will not let the baby grow. Correct, that will lead to IUGR. Okay, any chronic disease in the mother <coughs> or factors interfering with the blood flow and oxygen flow between the mother's uterus and the placenta or exposure to any teratogens. Okay, next is the placental factors. Okay, any placental malformation, any infarcts or any focal lesion, placental abruption or placenta previa and insufficient uteroplacental perfusion that which can happen in case of preeclampsia if present in the mother. And finally, coming to the fetal factors, okay, there can be constitutional growth delay in the fetus or there can be any malformation or there can be any chromosomal abnormality or congenital infection, torches infection that can affect the fetus. So this was the etiology or cause for SGA babies. <coughs> Next is how do we divide this ACMA, IUGR babies? How do we divide? This is based on the pondial index. Why is it important is? If the insert has occurred in the initial three months of life or early or late, it helps us to differentiate. Okay. So, what is pondial index? Pondial index is cube root of cube root of weight in grams divided by length into 100. Okay, we can it can be asymmetric IUGR or symmetric IUGR. If the ratio is less than two, it is asymmetric. If it is more than two, it is symmetric IUGR. Asymmetric IUGR is what is called as head sparing IUGR because it happens in later part of pregnancy. Most of the head growth occurs in the first trimester itself. So it is called head sparing IUGR. The head of the baby will be fine. The size of the head will be fine, but the body appears small, correct? As compared to symmetric IUGR, wherein the head as well as the body will be small, okay? So they'll be proportionately small and that is why they're called symmetric IUGR. So, if the significant intrinsic problem, fetal problems, <coughs> uh, the as compared to asymmetric IUGR, since it affects the initial three months of life, wherein organogenesis and CNS development is taking place, the symmetric IUGR babies tend to have much more significant fetal problems as compared to asymmetric IUGR babies. Okay, and this is the photo of the IUGR. See, the baby itself appears small, and there are skin wrinkling correct which you can see so this will help you to identify fine next is what are the potential complications like we how we saw in preterm baby what are the complications that the iugr baby can have they can have congenital anomalies because that itself is one of the cause perinatal depression okay meconium aspiration can take place pulmonary hemorrhage pulmonary hypertension hypoglycemia because they have less stores, okay, hypocalcemia, hypothermia, polycythemia, and thrombocytopenia. These are few of the definite, these are few of the complications of IUGR babies, okay. <coughs>